All right, sorry about that. Uh, we are, I'm back and we're ready to go. All right, so the uh, first thing, uh, different utility processes you should consider in filtering your brewery. Um, first one, your air, your oxygen supply. Um, a lot of that comes in direct contact with your wort if you're doing aeration um, or depending on what you're doing with your various filling, bottling, kegging processes, uh, you might have a compressed air supply going there or your direct oxygen. Uh, same thing with any gas you bring in a facility. Uh, most commonly, you would have CO2 um, that you'd have in a number of different places or in a number of different uh, locations, depending on what you're trying to do, um, and, or nitrogen. Uh, la last one before the tank fence is uh, steam supply, whether you're using it to actually directly heat product or process, or you're just using it in very pe various pieces of equipment. Uh, it's something you really want to consider looking at. And then the last one, um, non-pressurized tanks. This could be uh, grain storage. This could be product storage. Uh, this could be your water, incoming water tank if you have a buffer tank. Um, but anything that's non-pressurized. This is not what we're going to talk about with these vent filters at the end uh, is, not, uh, is not for, you know, your fermentation tank where you're actually, you know, doing CO2 inlets or things like that. This is non-pressurized water, grain storage, you know, things like that. Uh, maybe even chemical storage or yeast tanks or things like that, that you are allowing like actual air to come into. Uh, a couple of things to consider. Uh, the first is there's no brewery like law that tells you you have to filter this at this specific point or you have to do that. Um, but there are a number of different uh, industries that we gather this application data from to give you good recommendations of what you should be looking at when you're when you're filtering. This is different than like OSHA uh, coming in telling you you might need a certain distance between tanks or you need cleaning supplies in the bathroom. Um, that there's no, you know, there's no brewery law that's going to come in and tell you you have to filter your air or your CO2 to a specific guideline. Um, but there's a lot of other industries uh, in the food and beverage production space that already have these hard guidelines. And so that's where we get a lot of these recommendations from. Uh, the first one, uh, the dairy industry, uh, 3A standards um, that would apply to a lot of the stainless and the housings, but specifically they have references for any air, gas, and steam application. They have very specific micron levels, ratings, things that I, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, there, there's various things that you can get into with that. Um, second one uh, I have listed there, FDA recommendations for any food processing or beverage uh, applications. The FDA has specific recommendations for what the uh, direct food, direct beverage contact for air or gas applications would come into. Um, and then the, one, uh, the next one, the ISBT standards, that's uh, very specific to the like carbonated soft drink industry um, about what CO2 and gas supply uh, what, what you can allow to be in there, what you need to check for from your vendors uh, and things like that. Um, Brian asked a question about the CO2. Uh, I'm going to get to that one specifically um, in uh, when we talk about CO2 filters in a couple minutes, but I will get to Brian's question. Um, next two things to think about, um, common sense. Um, there, there are some things when we talk about the steam filters in terms of keeping your equipment clean um, and really um, the, the gist of the whole presentation is like helping to helping your brewery to get predictable results and removing variables uh, when you're trying to make these types of decisions, whether you want to filter something or whether it makes sense. Um, that's the end result is really making making your results pre predictable that you're not having to deal with things change on a regular basis because of, you know, something small and in, insignificant. Um, and the other part of that is product and equipment uh, protection. Um, the, the last thing I think you should really look at when you're trying to make these decisions is uh, the financial aspect of it. Um, a lot of the filtering that we're going to be talking about uh, really deals with the equipment just as much as the process. And a broken piece of equipment is going to cost you downtime as well as money to fix it. And so if you can keep your processes clean, whether it be an air or gas, steam, uh, whatever it may be, if you can keep that clean and then it keeps your equipment clean and working 
correctly, uh, you eliminate the issue of downtime or possibly having to fix something broken um, because of something that was coming through in a steam line or an airline. Um, next one, uh, batch or product loss. Um, there's a certain amount of uh, bacteria or things that can be present in various uh, process supplies uh, that are coming in, whether it be from a vendor or whether just from standard air. Um, and it's something that if there's enough contaminant, I mean, you could essentially, you know, ruin a batch. And depending on the size of your brewery, uh, that is something that could be a really, really big deal and a very, very costly thing. Or it could be a small thing and it's not necessarily, you know, the risk of it is not necessarily worth, you know, investing in filtration in a number of areas. Um, and then the last one, uh, flavor or aroma effects. Um, the first Brewers Conference I went to um, about nine years ago, I sat in on a session uh, about CO2 quality. And the guy who was giving the presentation made a really great point that if a customer goes to a bar and drinks a beer, he can't tell the difference whether or not you had quality CO2 in the product. Um, it was really whether or not it tasted good or tasted bad. And so if you weren't protecting yourself on the front end, you know, somewhat you could essentially ruin a customer's taste profile or ruin a customer's experience that would then not come back to your brewery later on because they don't know the difference between, you know, good quality, you know, CO2 induction in the beer at a specific point. And so it's something that, you know, it might affect the flavor and that's something that, you know, you can't really guard against or advertise against or market for um, as you're talking about it. Um, so the first one, um, air and oxygen supplies. Uh, first, uh, in terms of location to filter, uh, wart aeration is one of the biggest ones that when you're injecting either air into the wart that you're gonna do it, there's normally a compressed airline um, that's doing it. Um, that you want to make sure that that airline is clean. Um, the air that's being grabbed to do that, if you're using air, uh, is just coming from outside your compressor and being drawn in. Um, so it's something that normally the compressor would have some sort of simple filtration setup on it, um, but that's not necessarily enough that you want to make sure you're really taking care of, you know, what's going on. Uh, similar thing would be yeast propagation. You know, there's going to be an air inlet there that you're going to be utilizing. And whether you're using air or oxygen, um, it's really something that you want to make sure you check that you're uh, filtering to keep the impurities out that we'll get to next. Um, and then the last one, bottling and filling equipment, whether it's kegging, canning, um, you know, bottling line. Um, normally speaking, on all of those pieces of equipment, there's an air inlet, a gas inlet. And if depending on how you're cleaning it, there might be a steam inlet. Um, and the last thing that you shoot into that uh, keg or bottle or can, uh, you want to be as clean and as pure as possible. Um, so that way you're not going to be a, a affecting taste, shelf life, or any of those things that uh, will go into it. Uh, in terms of what you're trying to remove, um, particularly from a compressed air standpoint, you're trying to remove as much oil and excess liquid as possible. Um, when you're using an air compressor, even with an oilless one, um, you'll pick up quite a bit of liquid from just the humidity in the air, no matter where you are in the world, um, that's going to be run through the compressor. Um, and then the other part that other two things you're really trying to remove are, you know, general particulates and then any sort of uh, bacteria that might be present. Um, oxygen, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute when we get to uh, CO2 and other gases about where that bacteria might get picked up. Um, but from an air supply, uh, you know, in the general air, you know, there's always going to be some sort of unknown in terms of bacteria, fungus, you know, whatever's floating around. Um, when that compressor draws it in to be compressed, uh, you have to be prepared that that's going to be in the system until it starts getting filtered out. And the filters that you're getting from your compressor company um, are not designed to remove that bacteria. They're removed, designed to remove a little bit of oil and liquid, a little bit of particulates, and then there's a leftover thing that they qualify as being okay. Um, but depending on what you're looking for, uh, that's really kind of the next step of what you're trying to remove. Um, two pictures that I have here to the right. Uh, the one on the bottom is kind of a cartoonish uh, version of what you would see under a microscope. Um, the bottom one is a like common depth filter that you would see that is really soaking in the impurities um, before you would take it out and throw it away. Um, and then the top one, uh, this, if you looked under a microscope, this is typically what's happening in our style 
the MicroPure brand style of filters is that we're really trapping everything upstream on top uh, to kind of keep it out of your um, supply. The top picture um, is actually a picture we pulled out of a um, compressed air application in a brewery. Um, the mix of what is on the discs is the, the disc that you're looking at is a little bit of oil um, and a lot of particulate that was coming through the system. Uh, and that's something that we were pulling out of the system that would have ended up downstream, you know, somewhere that could have had a big effect in the process. And so that's, I mean, a real life, you know, version of what you're pulling out. Uh, in terms of the, the specifics about the type of filter you would need, um, if you're doing air, oxygen, and then we'll get to this with the gases, uh, it's the same type of filter. Uh, it's a sterile filter. Um, sterile sounds like a very big and strong word, um, but it's really rated, you know, much to the micron. Um, that zero, what's in parentheses is the micron level that we'd be talking about. Uh, it's a 0 0.2 micron, whether it's an element or our style, we're using kind of a stack disc media setup. Uh, typically, it's made out of some sort of Teflon. You could find it in other materials, um, but those don't clean as well, uh, and they aren't necessarily rated uh, the same way that a sterile filter would be. So I'd be cautious if you're looking at something, um, and it's not a Teflon material when you're looking at a sterile application. Um, the other thing to be really uh, cognizant of is the efficiency number. Uh, normally, a sterile filter will be rated at 99 point, and then there should be seven decimal places. That's what that log seven represents. Uh, there should be seven decimal places after it. Um, and that's what the like testing is really rated on. Uh, the second part of it is, is you really want a stainless steel housing. 304 or 316 uh, at this point doesn't make a huge difference in terms of it being sterile. Um, what makes more of the difference is the actual filter element on the inside. Um, this is not something that you should really be getting a standard steel painted housing or an aluminum housing. But if you want to have something that's sterile, you need to have a, a stainless steel housing as part of it. Um, and particularly in a brewery setting where you're going to have a lot of liquid and a lot of moisture, um, the stainless is a much better option in the, the long term. Uh, in terms of the couple of notes, uh, I had kind of mentioned it before, a single compressor filter series that you're going to get um, uh, that you're going to get from your compressor company when your compressor goes in. Um, that there's good protection at a general industrial level, um, but it's not, uh, not enough protection when you're talking about putting this air or oxygen directly into a, um, directly into the product or into a piece of equipment. Um, second one, the line material is really important. Um, if you're using, if you're a very small brewery and you're using like flexible line hose, um, make sure you're using a good quality plastic line hose that you're not dealing with something that's going to degrade or like send stuff downstream. Um, and then if you're big enough that you have permanent lines, um, you know, stainless steel lines are the best, best way to go. And that's when we talk about these air systems. And if you look on the brewery map, uh, as your, uh, as one of the handouts, um, you can you can always filter in a number of ways that you can do point of use that you put a lot of smaller filters right at the final point of where you're going to filter or you can put in one big filter at the beginning. Um, if you can do point of use filters, uh, that's always the most effective way to go because you have less line space afterwards until you get the piece of equipment um, and uh, and you don't have to worry about spending a lot of money on like high end, you know, lines that you can just have standard, you know, airlines or whatever else. And then also, um, you know, just have the simplest way to go after that. Um, two questions that came up. Um, I will answer both of those at the quent, uh, both of those at the end. Um, but they're, they're both simple answers, but I'll kind of get to them at the end when we, uh, have a chance. Uh, next, uh, the one requirement as part of this to think about, uh, is the uh, one I referenced from the FDA. Uh, the biggest reference point from the FDA when they talk about the food processing requirements, um, the, it applies to anything that the food or product, beverage, anything would come in contact with. So the actual product uh, and not necessarily, uh, you know, a tank space or a table or anything like that. Um, and the biggest two points of it were the point might to micron filtration um, and then the little to no carryover from the filter to the process supply that you were working with. 
All right, so the next one, uh, next filter application would be carbon dioxide or nitrogen. Um, these could be at various points in your facility, but they both have kind of a similar path. Um, I actually put uh, part of the path on uh, the right there in picture form. Um, this is part of the giant uh, brewery map that I put in the handout sections. Uh, in terms of locations to filter, uh, bulk storage into your facility, whether you do it immediately at the bulk tank or you wait till inside the facility and you find a closer point, um, either of those locations are good. Uh, next one would be entry points into tanks. Um, if you're doing tank to tank movement uh, and counterbalancing uh, via you know, CO2 or nitrogen uh, to cap off the extra space, um, when you're injecting that into the tanks, that's when you would really want to filter it prior to that. Um, any other process contact points that you may have, if it's through a piece of equipment or in a brake tank or anything else, uh, that's where you want to look at. And then very similar to the air and oxygen, uh, the bottling and filling equipment um, is where you're going to be looking at filters too, depending on how your, you know, your facility is set up. In terms of impurities, uh, very similar to the air and oxygen supply, uh, really trying to remove oils and liquids uh, that might be present in the CO2 supply, uh, particulates, uh, bacteria, and then hydrocarbons and possible odors that might be present in the uh, gas supplies. Uh, filters, uh, in terms of the filter, uh, identical filter to what was needed in the air and nitrogen or excuse me, the air and the oxygen uh, examples I talked about earlier. Uh, sterile, sterile media, uh, Teflon media is the best way to go. Uh, stainless steel housing uh, are, is what you're really looking for. Uh, the picture to the right uh, is the incoming nitrogen supply at the Miller Coors facility in Golden. Um, they have a filter right there, catch all the impurities right before it goes into their system. Um, that they can maintain. That's actually, as you're looking at the picture, a relatively large filter for a gas supply. Uh, normally the gas supply filters are much smaller um, because the flow rates that you're typically dealing with don't need a, a large filter to either capture the impurities or um, put you in a scenario where you would need it. Um, in terms of notes, um, and this is where I can answer uh, the first CO2 questioning. Um, in terms, of, in terms of whether or not your uh, food grade or, or industrial grade CO2 is okay, um, is kind of a two or a three-part answer. The first part, um, it goes right to the notes here, is knowledge of your gas vendor, uh, the gas creation, and the supply chain is a really, really important aspect of whether or not industrial grade CO2, food grade CO2, or even better is okay. Um, the first thing that you should be really concerned about when you start talking to your vendors about any of this is finding out how your CO2 or your um, gases are getting made um, and then also um, whether or not they can provide certification. Um, so that's really the first part, getting a cert certificate that tells you what's in your CO2, what are the possible uh, contaminants you might be dealing with. Um, and then also understanding what they test for and what they don't. Um, and we'll get to the, the other part that goes into that is there are a number of, from the ISBT, um, there's a number of different things that they should be specifically testing for in terms of impurities and things that could be in your gas stream. And so if they are testing for those, um, great. And you have certification based off of that. Um, but then if they're not, that's something that you might need to look for a different CO2 supplier or um, filtering is the simplest way to go. Um, now, as part of that, uh, the question you're specifically asking, uh, food grade, industrial grade uh, is one, two of possibly like 10 different grades of CO2. And it's really based on the purity level. So industrial grade is a specific purity level of, you know, 98.5% you know, um, of a general filtration uh, when they get it at their faci facility. And then food grades a little bit higher. And then there's pharmaceutical and other grades above that, depending on what you're using it for. Um, and so it's really an answer of what your specific vendor is supplying in either of those scenarios and not, not and less of 
if the general industrial or the general food grade um, is acceptable. Realistically, food grade, for the most part, you should be getting good enough CO2 that it shouldn't be an issue, um, but it's really specific to your vendor in terms of what they can supply you for certification. And um, if they're consistently testing their CO2 that you're sending you um, as part of that. Um, second part uh, of the notes, uh, very similar to the air and oxygen supply, the line material after the filter is really important. Um, and the point of use is most often the most effective way to go. Um, the more you can eliminate extra costs from line, uh, line material, um, the easier it's gonna be for you that if you can use a less expensive line material prior to a filter, use the filter and then use stainless after that um, to get your equipment, that would be great because that would help uh, ensure that you're getting the highest quality uh, filter filtering into your process. Um, but to do that, uh, you've got to make sure you have a filter there and then the effective um, line material afterwards. Um, in terms of requirements to think about, first one uh, is that same one from the FDA in terms of micron level um, and that you're not carrying, carrying anything over from the filter to your actual process supplies. Uh, the ISBT standards, very specific to nitrogen and your CO2. Uh, Moisture removal, the actual gas composition, if there's other air and gases percentage-wise that are in there, uh, hydrocarbon counts, um, and then volatile hydrocarbon counts. Um, both of the hydrocarbons deal specifically with actual uh, carbon-based uh, particulate or uh, anything in your CO2 supply that could cause spoilage, rottening, smells, odors, anything. Um, so that's something that should be on, as I referenced before, should be on your vendor uh, certificate when you get your gas in. Um, there should be a whole section on hydrocarbon count um, that you can look at to make sure it's below the specific levels. Um, but that's two things very specifically from the ISBT that help uh, keep the quality of your CO2 at the level that it needs to be. Uh, next one, steam filter. Uh, steam filters can be used in a number of different ways and locations throughout the brewery. Uh, first one, very simply, uh, post boiler prior to system entry. Uh, depending on whether or not you have steam in your brewery and you use it for different things, um, these filters can be really effective for helping with a number of different things. Um, point of use would be the next one. Uh, whether it's either direct contact with your process or direct contact with your equipment when it's used as cleaning. So if you're going to be putting steam, if you're going to be using steam as your cleaning agent for any of your tanks, lines, anything else, um, and that's where your beer, wort, water is going through as well, those are points that you really want to make sure that you're getting clean steam in there, that you're not bringing other stuff from the boiler and your water supply that's getting steamed into um, as part of the problem. Uh, and then the last one, filling equipment prior to entry point. Um, just as we talked about with any of the gases, uh, there's normally uh, on any of your keg cleaning or filling or anything, there's normally a steam line. Um, that's a point that if it's going into your equipment, uh, that's something where you really want to look at making sure that you get it filtered. Uh, in terms of the impurities that you're trying to remove, uh, rust particulate and iron um, are the more hard ones that you're trying to pull out. Um, the iron carryover, um, is something that can come from your water supply or the boiler. Uh, rust in particular uh, can come from the boiler, your lines. Um, and so it's something, your line material, as well as the age of your system uh, will really dictate how much or how little that, uh, how, how much or how little your rust and particulate is gonna be an issue. Um, even young systems that have new, you know, black iron pipes, I mean, those will rust and corrode over time. Um, and so it's just a matter of time before you start ending up with more and more as part of it. So even if you have a brand new system, um, that's something to consider uh, putting some protection on to see what you can remove to make your steam clean as you're going through. Um, the second one is the carryover from the boiler or the water supply. Uh, depending on how hard or soft your water is, what you're doing with water filtration, when you put that into the boiler to turn into steam, um, there's going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be something that's going to come over that you're going to want to try to 
trap and remove prior to using it in your process. Uh, two pictures I have up. Uh, first one uh, in the upper left is from a steam filter that we rebuilt um, from a brewery that you can see the black iron and particulate that was caught just on one of the discs. Um, this was a relatively small filter. Um, so it was something that, you know, you can clean, you know, at your facility. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's a good visual representation of what you're really trying to pull out. Um, and then the uh, bottom right hand corner, um, this is a brewery up in Western Canada. Um, their condensate line, which is pre-filter. So this is before it goes to the filter, but you can see it's bright red. So that's the amount of rust that is coming out of their system with all that liquid. And so those are, I mean, two examples that those are things that you don't want going into your equipment. You don't want going into your tanks and you don't want coming in contact with your product because um, you're trying to keep it as reliable and as pure as possible. <clears throat> so the type of filter that's needed, uh, there's two different types of filters that we recommend for these situations, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, there's a three micron and a 25 micron stainless steel filter media. And then same thing would be a stainless steel housing. Um, you don't necessarily need the stainless steel housing from a purity standpoint, um, but you do need it from a longevity standpoint. That if you try to use a steel housing or some other material, uh, you're going to run into problems with it rusting um, and the heat of the steam, even on low pressure systems over time, is going to degrade the housing that for the little bit of extra cost you're going to get, uh, having a stainless steel housing makes a lot of sense. Uh, in terms of notes, uh, the knowledge of your uh, feed water, boiler chemicals, uh, system materials, and condensate path are all really important in terms of knowing what is in your steam supply. Um, from the beginning of it, I mean, your feed water, I mean, most of you are concerned about your feed water when you start looking at brewing recipes and what you may need or may need to remove to make the beer you want. Uh, the same thing holds true for your steam supply. Um, if you have really, really, really hard water, uh, you're going to end up with a lot of crap in your steam system. Or if you put a lot of softener in it to fix, you know, problems that you may have, uh, you're going to end up with that type of stuff in your steam system as well. And that's the stuff that you want to make sure you're filtering and trying to remove. Um, and the same thing holds true with the boiler chemicals. You know, the boiler chemicals that they're putting in, um, uh, they're trying to do things to either protect your pipes or protect your boiler. Um, that's stuff that's going to get sent over into your lines and into your product uh, as part of it. Um, so you want to make sure you check the chemicals with your suppliers that they're safe for this type of stuff and that there's not any issues that they could be causing um, problems with your product, materials, tanks, anything else. Um, and then system materials, uh, whether you're using black iron pipe, copper, stainless steel, um, anything else that you're going to use for lines, you want to make sure you know that as you start considering these things that each of those different metals is going to give you a different possible rust or particulate level that you want to make sure you're filtering out. And then the last one, condensate path. Um, if you're taking your condensate uh, and running it back to the boiler, uh, you're creating a really big loop of the same stuff. So knowing what you can remove and what you can send back to your boiler, if you have that type of thing in your facility, uh, is an important thing to remember. Um, Last two things, lime material, as I've talked about with all these other filters, is an important choice. I mean, the more you can get high purity uh, lines in your facility, the better you're gonna be. It's gonna make it easier. Um, and then point of use, it, most effective and safest choice. The less distance you can have between filter and equipment or filter and product uh, just means less line material and less other you know stuff you're really gonna have to deal with. Uh, two pictures I have here. Uh, big stainless steel housing. Uh, I mean, very similar to any of the other applications we talked about. Um, and then the picture on the right, um, this is our steam filter element that we use. Um, so very similar to the design of the um, air and gas filters that we talked about earlier. Uh, only difference is we use a woven stainless steel media. Uh, so in the steam filter, everything is 100% um, 304 or 316 stainless. Um, so it's really easy to clean and it's really easy to run your process through. Uh, in terms of the type of filter, uh, one of the things I forgot to mention, the three micron filter uh, is something that's designed for actual product contact. You know, if it's ever going to come in contact with the actual uh, beer, wort, um, kegs, anything, uh, that's when you'd be wanting to use a, a three micron. 
Uh, the 25 micron is if it's only servicing equipment that's never going to actually see product. So you might have jacketing on a tank um, or steam that's running some other part of a system. Um, that's a good point to just put in a simple higher micron filter to really catch large scale debris and everything else that you're putting uh, into the jacket. So that way you get uh, the highest flow rate and the most effective uh, steam possible as part of it. Uh, in terms of requirements to think about, uh, a lot of our steam supplies, uh, steam supply requirements from a filtration side come from the dairy industry. Um, they're very specific in terms of using steam to clean all their equipment. Um, they, the reference they use uh, is a nominal two micron or an absolute five micron filter for process use and direct use. Um, nominal and absolute has to do with the retention of the filter. So in an absolute example, uh, it would be 99.99997% retention at whatever micron they're talking about. Very, very similar to that log seven efficiency that I was talking about in the air, air and gas filters and their slides. Um, the nominal um, is just a lower retention. So when you, if you were looking at a filter and an application, if you're asking for a nominal two micron or an absolute five micron, um, they're actually roughly the same filtration level, but by, use, by saying nominal or absolute, it gives you a specific retention level. So nominal is typically like 95%, and then absolute is almost 100, um, but a, a little bit of a smaller decimal. Um, pictures here that you see, uh, one of our smaller filters on the right, um, filters can be bigger or smaller depending on the application. So it's not something that you're fixed at buying one size filter that's going to work for everyone. Um, it really can be made bigger or smaller depending on what you need. Um, and then the picture on the left really kind of shows our flow path that typical filters in these type of applications are normally like outside in that they would go into the housing, fill up the housing, go through the element and then outside or excuse me, inside the element to the rest of the process. Uh, last one, uh, last one, or excuse me, last application that we have uh, is a tank vent filter. Uh, locations of filter, there's not a ton in the brewery. The tank vent filters are much more uh, general food and beverage processing, uh, carbonated soft drinks, uh, dairy industry, um, even distilleries at certain points. Um, but really one of the few unpressurized locations you have typically like a water storage tank or even if you have a dry grain storage on your facility that uh, if you're going to have it breathing to open air whether it's in the facility or just outside uh, you want to make sure that you have some sort of just general protection on it so that way you're not um, not allowing outside impurities from air bacteria or anything else into the uh, location uh, the picture that you're looking at to write, uh, another example of a set of discs that we pulled off. Uh, this is from a, a tank vent uh, on a water tank um, in rural Tennessee. And they, I mean, this is the type of stuff that was in, in the air supply in their facility. So if you can imagine this filter sitting on top of a tank, a water tank inside their facility, and this is the air that's coming in. So that's the stuff that got removed prior to the water going into the um, you know, initial kettle or cleaning or anything else. So uh, impurity and impurities are trying to remove uh, airborne dirts, particulates, uh, bacterias uh, that you really don't want getting in your process flow. Um, it's a wide variety of stuff that you can catch and just make sure that you're consistently getting pure and reliable results. Uh, type of filter you need. Um, anytime you're talking air, air and gases, it's pretty much always the same type of filter. Uh, it's a Teflon or a PTFE media. Uh, the units typically mount on top of a non-pressurized tank and they allow it to breathe air in and breathe air out um, while staying sterile at the same time inside the environment. Um, typically speaking, they're called a vent filter or tank vent filter. Uh, another name for it is a breather filter because the tank's literally breathing, uh, depending on what the pressure ratings are in your tanks. Um, that's normally taken into account when these things are sized. Um, and then last, it's just real good, simple protection for unpressurized tanks. Um, these things are not based on how big your tank is, but how much your tank is flowing. Um, so even your tank could be 30,000 gallons. And if you have a very low flow, you would have a very tiny filter. So it's not something that you need to have a massive filter for a massive tank. Um, it's really based on the flow. Um, 
picture to the right that I have there is kind of an expanded view of what the vent looks like. Um, because it's not pressurized, we don't have a housing and closing the entire filter. Uh, what we really have is the same segmented element uh, that you would look at in any of our filters uh, with the discs. Uh, but then all that you really get on top is a very simple, uh, what we refer to as like a weather hood that is going to knock, you know, it's not going to let, um, you know, large bugs or, you know, anything crazy get in there. Um, and then it re can really focus on filtering the, you know, smaller, smaller air. Uh, requirement to think about uh, is that same one from the FDA um, that really applies to a lot of uh, a lot of the air and gas supplies we talked about. Uh, 0.2 micron filtration, uh, no carryover from from the filter to the point of process is really what they're trying uh, trying to cover. So, uh, two questions I do want to answer. Uh, Rob's question uh, about cleaning the filters. All of our filters can be cleaned. Um, that's not necessarily true for every uh, filtration company out there. There are filters that are designed that you install, use once and throw away. Um, ours are designed to be cleaned. Um, the cleaning cycle is really dependent on how clean or dirty your supply is. So in an air example, um, how clean or dirty your air supply is, uh, is really going to dictate how often you have to clean it. Um, but realistically, you should be talking about like, a week to a month before you need to clean these things, um, depending on how bigger or how small your process flow is, it might be more prudent for you to clean after every batch, um, or it's something that you might need to just put into your, you know, regularly scheduled maintenance uh, once every two weeks or once every month um, to run it through a cleaning cycle. Uh, most of the clean, most of the filters on the market, uh, including ours. Uh, have a way to be uh, regenerated, uh, whether it be an autoclave or steam in place or back flushing. Uh, there's a number of different ways that you can clean these filters uh, to get you back to square one. Uh, almost all the filtration manufacturers have it so you can regenerate a number of times. Um, our filters are about 150 times to regenerate them. So if you're willing to invest in you know, a cleaning cycle, um, it's a really good option uh, to keep something for a long period of time and not necessarily having to be uh, sending spare parts or ordering spare parts all the time to replace what you have. Um, and then the last question from David, uh, equipment links uh, in the handout section, uh, there should be a number of downloads for the equipment that we talked about. Um, and then my contact information is available that if there's something specific in terms of an application that you want to look at, um, I can email you more information and uh, spe specific documentation uh, about it. Uh, so that was at the end of my presentation. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, I'm going to stick around for the next 10 or 15 minutes. So feel free to type them in. And I'll be glad to answer them. Um, but that, uh, that, that was the end of my presentation. So if there's, uh, any questions, I'll stick around. If not, thank you for being here and, uh, participating in this. I appreciate you as an audience. Yeah, I'm going to answer it in a second. Um, I'm going to pull up the brewery process map so I can see exactly uh, what you're referencing. Uh, 
Oh, it's um, it, Drew. Thanks, uh, Drew. Thanks for knowing that. It should be. Um, it's it's supposed to be for the ward aeration. I took the arrow one tank too far. Uh, in terms of finished beer filtering, uh, that's uh, probably a whole nother webinar in itself. Uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve is really gonna um, drive how what what piece of equipment you would want to filter on um, and what materials, uh, elements, you know, things like that that you would do. Um, and then the same thing is true for your your wart. Um, if you're trying to remove just general particulate and, you know, leftover, you know, large debris out of your wart, um, I think you could be choosing, you know, a different piece of equipment based on really what you're trying to do. Um, that's something if you want to send me an email uh, with what you're trying to accomplish, I mean, that'd be a better way of answering that because that's a really um, broad question that I could probably spend a half hour talking about. <laughs> 